Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 17th of June, 2020, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Sorry, I do apologise. The wrong lower third there, Brian. You're not Patrick. Well, um, <laughs> uh, was I alert enough to see that? No. <laughs> uh, where were we? So your, your uh, host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish, and we're joined by Alex Thompson bringing us Eastern approaches from the Netherlands. And of course, I'm not Patrick Henningsen, no, but he will be, be back, back on. He will be back on Friday, we're pleased to say. Uh, right. Uh, let's get started with this. This was being pushed out by uh, OrderOrder.com uh, yesterday. MPs legislate, legislate to ban protests. Uh, and uh, Greta Fox, not the only person to push this out. Uh, some of the smaller websites, London Loves Business, uh, protest banned by law and gatherings of more than six people is now a criminal offence, said the headline. Uh, and the Daily Express got on it as well. Protest banned, gatherings of more than six people now illegal. London must act. Uh, and I have to say, Brian and Alex, this is the most unbelievably disgraceful journalism I have seen uh, for a very, very long time because it's an outright untruth. Uh, the truth is... Uh, that what happened was that this legislation was passed. This is the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions England Amendment Number 3, Regulations 2020. It's a statutory instrument, therefore secondary legislation. Uh, it was originally, as you can see on screen at the moment, originally written on the 31st of May, therefore before any of the uh, protests took place. Uh, and uh, of course, it's not about stopping people protesting. It's about relaxing the lockdown because the previous legislation had said that no more than two people were allowed to gather outside unless you were it was your immediate household so as we scroll through this we can see the process that the uh, statutory instrument has gone through now most statutory instruments many of them anyway uh, i think alex can confirm this in a second many of them uh, don't really get any massive oversight by parliament at all uh, in in this case uh, there was some debate there was actually a debate on the 15th uh, and it was then approved, so it's scheduled uh, for the 27th of June. That's when the approval period ends. But in fact, the approval has already happened. So I'm sorry, Daily Express, uh, but this is absolute fake news. And Alex, uh, if I could just bring you into the programme here uh, straight away. I do wonder whether these headlines were designed to try to uh, incite uh, feeling here. Uh, there's obviously been quite a bit of controversy over the fact that the protests have been taking place at all without social distancing and so on. Uh, but the, the, it's almost as if the, the media uh, wanted to encourage more protests or give people another thing to protest about. Well, I suppose we could say there's three options there, Mike. One is completely ignorant reporting. It is just about possible that Fleet Street journalists of the new generation don't know what a statutory instrument is. That's possible. Uh, the kind of middle gradation would be that they understand what an SI is, but are just reflecting, you know, some kind of groundswell or, or feel that they're reflecting the public mood, social journalism, which doesn't really belong on front pages, of course. And the uh, most dangerous interpretation or possibility is, of course, that they are deliberately whipping it up uh, because some journalists, as we're seeing in the United States now, do regard themselves and call themselves in their profiles on social media um, members of the resistance. Uh, of course, in this country, it's not against uh, President Trump, but similar things. If anyone's wondering about these statutory instruments, and you're quite right, most of them do not get looked at by members of parliament. They're simply, as in the jargon, laid before the House. In the, in, the, in the library for a certain number of days. Uh, you can read a classic from the early 20th century, I think 1929, by Lord Hewitt of Berry called The New Despotism. And recently, an American scholarly equivalent by Philip Hamburger called Is Administrative Law Unlawful? And both of these are pointing out that the chain of parliamentary legislation is being obviated with the excuse of, well, ministers need to be able to respond uh, in an agile fashion. So ministries themselves can just re uh, you know, rehash the schedules of banned substances or banned events without having to recourse to parliament. So effectively, it's the government legislating and not us. Uh, indeed. But I think uh, getting back to the, the media part of this, Alex, the, the one that that surprised me most was uh, was Guido Fox, who absolutely does understand what a statutory instrument is. Now, this uh, originally began as a tweet uh, where somebody was was uh, making a comment on on a tweet that the uh, gov or that Parliament had put out the, about the fact that this uh, uh, statutory instrument had passed. 
Um, so I was particularly surprised that uh, that Guido Fox would have fallen for this. Again, Guido Fox is more than I forget the surname now. Paul, I think, is his first name. The gentleman who set it up, uh, the slightly chubby chap who uh, went and uh, gave evidence in parliamentary committee hearings and built up the blog. Uh, he has now recruited a team of young copywriters, so that is a possibility, but it's more likely, I think, when you get to that level, that we're speaking about infiltration. And Guido, of course, is supposed to be a vaguely pro-Tory, certainly right of centre outlet, so it could be a captured opposition, a phenomenon which we've seen before, which tends to focus on the centre-right, uh, you know, also known as the faux-servative or, or various other brands. I see a wag in the comment has suggested that uh, some people in politics are so ill-informed that they think statutory instruments are laws to get rid of statues. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Very good. Uh, well, we'll just uh, say that uh, Martin in the in the chat box did correctly uh, make the point that uh, the protests were originally banned in the original legislation, of Section 7 of the original uh, legislation, if anybody wants to go and look that up. Now, Alex, you forwarded uh, this through to me earlier today for comment. Um, I'm very interested to know where this particular graphic came from and uh, just describe it for our for our listeners. It's come from a, a Russian Twitter account. I'll say that straight out. So I'm not accused of being a uh, what's the word, a repeater or an amplifier uh, is the usual integrity initiative doctrine. Now, it is unverified and I've seen it from uh, a Russian Twitter account called Panther of Tig uh, Tigris or something like that, Siberian Tiger in Latin. Uh, but he's pointing out the extreme similarity between the Black Lives Matter poster uh, on the right, which itself would need verification. Perhaps some of our viewers can uh, look into this, perhaps looking at the hashtag LDNBLM, London Black Lives Matter, and find out whether this handbill has been distributed or posted anywhere. And the one on the left, which has, at least I've looked into the Ukrainian here, it is a more or less direct translation, but not a, uh, you know, a senseless translation, uh, referring to protests going on uh, on the 14th of June uh, in Kiev and look at the extreme visual similarity, the same information in the same blocks here. So, you know, take your protective equipment, the same uh, symbols two thirds of the way down the page. Uh, the white bit in the middle is talking uh, about, you know, the same uh, detail of look for social media updates. Even the subject of the protests and the objects of the protest are the same. They're gathering, if you look at the bottom right of the um, the, Rush, the English block, peaceful protest, US embassy, uh, there's mention on the Ukrainian one as well of uh, peacefully rallying against outside the Ukrainian embassy. Of course, in Ukraine, it's not Black Lives Matter, there being very few people of African origin in Ukraine. Uh, but the one in Ukraine is called Patriot ne Zlochin, it's meaning the patriot is not a criminal. Uh, prima facie, this is Soros doing the same things in different countries. Uh, but we will look into this further. And we'd be particularly grateful if anyone can confirm the, or the, the veracity of the BLM poster that was shown on the right there. OK, thank you, Alex. Uh, now, uh, let's uh, come back to this uh, article that uh, David was talking about on Monday. Uh, the hero Black, Black Lives Matter supporter uh, reveals the moment he carried white far right protester whose life was in danger to safety as he declare, declares it's not uh, black versus white. Uh, it's everyone versus the racist. So this is all about Patrick Hutchinson uh, in the photograph there. And uh, if you remember, David was uh, was asking uh, why Mr. Hutchison was wearing uh, these particular gloves. Well, um, yesterday, a couple of people sent me through a LinkedIn profile uh, called Patrick Hutchison, Hutchison uh, and he's described as a senior project manager at Universal Private Equity Limited. Uh, and uh, well, I have to say that when I saw this, uh, this LinkedIn profile, um, I almost fell off my chair and I'll explain why in a second. Um, so uh, this looks very much like the gentleman in the uh, in the um, report, uh, but we'll come on to that in a second as well. Um, so just looking at his uh, his um, profile here on LinkedIn, uh, technical project manager, he's worked for Nomura, he's worked for uh, uh, the for, for various banks, including Rabobank and so on, and ended up with this, uh, this little organization, Universal Private Equity Limited. Now, what's interesting about that is that it has no money. But anyway, the first question is, is it the same guy? Uh, so on the left is uh, the photograph on the LinkedIn profile. On the right is him on the uh, uh, Channel 4, on a Channel 4 interview in the last couple of days. And clearly he's uh, lost quite a bit of weight. Now he's described as a personal trainer now. 
Uh, so he's uh, perhaps quite a bit fitter than he was uh, when the uh, other photograph was taken, if this is the same person. I think it is, uh, but others may have uh, a different view. And again, if we can ask for help to uh, identify whether this is uh, the same person or not. But uh, th perhaps we get a clue again from the LinkedIn profile, because although, uh, you know, it says that he's been working in IT for Nomura and for uh, Rabobank, uh, actually, when you go and look at his interests, uh, what do we discover? Uh, Personal Trainer Network UK, Personal Trainer Net Marketing Network, Personal Trainers uh, uh, and so on. So a whole raft of personal training related uh, Interest. interests there. So, uh, you know, he has apparently left Universal Private Equity Limited in 2018. Uh, it seems that there is a good possibility this is the same guy. So anyway, why did I nearly fall off my chair when I saw the words private equity, uh, pri sorry, universal private equity limited? Well, it was because on the 8th of uh, June, uh, one of our researchers, Linda, uh, sent us an email talking about Black Lives Matter Limited, a company which is incorporated on the 8th of June 2020. Um, and uh, it uh, was, th there is the company there, Black Lives Matter Limited from the company's house website. Uh, and uh, th the thing is that its uh, owner, its director, is a guy called David Wilkes Carmichael. Uh, David Wilkes Carmichael there has, uh, it also happens to be the director of Universal Private Equity Limited. So we seem to have a connection between uh, Patrick Hutchinson, uh, Universal Private Equity Limited, uh, and therefore through Wilkes Carmichael, uh, the newly incorporated uh, company, uh, Black Lives Matter Limited. So let's uh, move on then. Uh, there's a related company then called Universal Private Capital PLC. And this seems to be some kind of business which is all about investments, venture capital, commercial finance, uh, some financial training apparently, offshore services, international banking, trusts and foundations, aviation services. They also, by the way, not on that screen, but they also uh, uh, look, uh, provide yachting services or you know, some kind of, whether it's able to buy. Uh, Bro you know, brokering, marine brokering. Well, that type of thing. Um, but this is a very interesting company as well because it also appears to have no money. Uh, and uh, well, here is their record from the from company's house. Uh, and you can see that uh, David Wilkes Carmichael is the director here as well. Uh, but as well as that, if we scroll on down, we find that Universal Private Equity Limited also holds a directorship uh, in this PLC. Um, now, I'm not quite sure what the advantages are for companies to, to do this. Uh, it certainly makes things much harder to track and trace uh, what's going on. And in fact, if we look at uh, David Wilkes Carmichael, uh, we find that aside from Black Lives Matter Limited, he has a host, as you can see, scrolled through very, very fast, a host of directorships, uh, a couple that have now expired. Uh, the last two there, I think, are, uh, are dissolved, but most of the company is still in existence. So who is this guy? What's the connection to Patrick Hutchinson? Uh, Alex, I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on this, but, but uh, uh, it, it's, there are already questions being raised in my mind about what, what is going on here and, and why uh, Patrick Hutchinson or what he's involved in is it is it a, do you think in any way related to security or intelligence services activity it is a possibility to be frank uh, the late Gordon Bowden was very good at sniffing out some of these details and perhaps some of the people in his old network would have a view on that Generally, I'd say, and there's not a hint of snobbery in what I'm going to say, because I'm talking about personal friends of mine as well. I'm certainly not generalizing about fit young black, black men only. Generally, if you have become variously described as a project manager or an IT man, IT man at the likes of Rabobank, which is the premier bank here in the Netherlands, and Nomura, which is one of the premier investment banks in the city of London, obviously Japanese in origin, it's unlikely that you would give up that lifestyle and that pay and that kudos and that cachet to be a personal trainer it is possible i'm well aware of the phenomenon of men who obviously are you know pumped up with with uh, testosterone and whatever and, and look after themselves who who you know want to be an alpha male in a more physical way and go off to personal training or you know um, uh, extreme sports but usually 
that's not the way it works. Uh, particularly if you have any kind of skills at the mathematical end for those banks, you are so fantastically well regarded and well paid that it would be extremely unlikely for you to go into something else. That's about all I could say about Mr. Hutchinson. I see a couple of commenters in the uh, chat box are already suggesting that the physiognomy of the two men on screen was different, not just the the, uh, the body mass. So possibly there's a switcheroonie going going on there. Uh, perhaps it's more that we need to look at Mr. Wilt Carmichael's end of the bargain. And again, we could call on perhaps more specialist viewers to advise us on whether that particular company shell model, it's effectively a shell model, is one which has got any kind of fiscal advantages in the in the British tax system. Right. OK. OK. Those are all fair comments, but uh, it goes on because let's uh, have a look at this article in the mirror. Uh, the headline, Black Hero Patrick, Patrick Hutchison, who rescued white protesters, speaks out for the first time. Um, and uh, well, what are they talking about here? Well, they happen to mention uh, that the people that he was with, his friends, uh, were this organization belonged to this organization, Arc Protection Limited, which is a personal protection security company. Um, and uh, so the article says, Mr. Hutchison, personal trainer who works with elite athletes in Wimbledon, southwest London. Uh, well, which elite athletes, that's not identified, uh, formed a group with four of his friends who are part of uh, London-based close protection group ARC Protection to protect young Black Lives Matter protesters from getting caught up in violence at the at the protests well, and so on. Now, in other uh, mainstream media, he has described Pierre Noah, the director of Arc Protection Limited, as, as a good friend. So now we've got uh, a connection here, uh, Alex, into some kind of private personal protection organization. Uh, we're not clear exactly what scale that sort of thing is. Uh, and coming back to your earlier comment, uh, you know, these un unidentified elite athletes, perhaps this implies uh, a better income than, than other personal trainers uh, uh, might obtain. But nonetheless, there are questions to be asked here. And I'm very keen to, to uh, ask people to, to help identify this. I think, uh, Brian, the, the thing that, that struck me about this photograph, just to end this up, is and the way that it's been portrayed, whether he is witting or unwitting in this, uh, the way that it has been portrayed by the media reminded me very much of the White Helmets in Syria. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think the message in it was was very clear. This was um, this was an event which was designed to put Black Lives Matter in in the right. They were doing the right thing. They taken a right wing demonstrator and they brought him to safety. This is a very emotive thing. Now, did it happen for real? Possibly. Um, is this something with a bit more depth to it? Certainly possibly, because we've seen very strange events going on before. But I have to say, you look at it, it and it's all a bit too squeaky clean. Um, it, Alex, it, if, if there's, there's a huge if and caveat on this, but if there was some kind of uh, uh, encouragement of bad behaviour from uh, people that are working with the government, uh, in this and a group of people was involved in that it perhaps got a little bit out of hand and there was uh, a decision made that in fact somebody's life was in danger uh, would it be reasonable to expect that people that were taking part in acti that activity might feel duty bound to, to uh, actually remove somebody from a, a, a position of serious risk? It has been known to happen in that way um, sometimes the intelligence agencies but more particularly uh police and um shall we say private security consultancies operating in london have a doctrine uh that they are allowing their agents in a particular situation to go thus far and no further and whether there's a code word or not they will call things off um or you know call the hunt off as it were if things get a bit too hairy sometimes to save a life or sometimes just for optics for presentational matters um i'm noticing on that name pierre noah that at least some of those who have that name are from french west africa cameroon so that's a possible connection there given that the issue is the racialization uh, of protests in london it's possible i'm putting two and two together to make five or six here that you have a group of uh, personal uh, protection agents, semi-public, semi-private in West London, um, who are from West Africa or, or black in any sense, uh, who have got together. And maybe someone has been presenting their um, their operation in a certain way, shall we say. 
Okay, so lots of questions there. We're very keen to to get to the bottom of those. So let's uh, let's get some effort into doing that now. Uh, David Scott has published uh, a follow up to what he was talking about on uh, on Monday. Uh, on the UK column website, do veteran lives matter at the Ministry of Defence? And this is because uh, yesterday we were passed uh, an internal memo uh, from Stephen Lovegrove, who's permanent secretary in the Ministry of Defence, uh, which he signed off with the hashtag uh, Black Lives Matter. And Alex, I was very keen to get your thoughts on this because uh, it seems to me that uh, civil servants aren't supposed to get involved in political discussion in this way. The civil service code has been clear for a very long time that you cannot campaign in party politics while you're a civil servant. It's not just a question of you know, endorsing things. You're not even allowed to be in uh, certain bodies and certainly not stand for office while you're in the civil service. Uh, and a kind of second tier around that, there's the general doctrine that you can't bring the impartiality of the civil service as encoded in the Northcut Trevelyan reforms in the early Victorian era into disrepute. Uh, however, in the last few years, as we've seen with even Leslie Scott at the, uh, so I beg your pardon, not Leslie Scott, that's a terrible mistake to make, uh, the head of the Scottish Civil Service, whose first name is Leslie, um, she has been taking the knee outside Butte House, the uh, home of the Scottish Government on behalf of Black Lives Matter. So it's possible that, uh, shall we say, uh, you know, right thinking people as they regard themselves in that bubble um, are so certain that Black Lives Matter is a universal uh, slogan or creed that it's become apolitical to them. Yes. Well, OK. Well, well, what are your well, thoughts? <laughs> well, I, I, I found it astonishing because they should not be doing that. But this, this is what has happened. We've now got politics driven through the whole of the civil service. This was a deliberate policy under Tony Blair. And what is the objective? Well, it means the whole thing has become one political mass mm. that can be controlled. Um, OK, if you uh, like what the column does and you'd like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. There are options to help us out there. Uh, just to bring you up to date on David Noakes, uh, he is now no longer in uh, Exeter Prison. He's been extradited to France, we believe. He's in the same prison as Linda Thayer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we will uh, give you more details uh, as they become known. Uh, obviously, in France, uh, hopefully, David will have the support of... Uh, of Scott Tips and uh, the National Health Federation, uh, because David is, I believe, uh, associated with them. Uh, and Scott has been uh, helping uh, over there with, with Linda Thayer. So hopefully that will, uh, we'll see uh, some action from uh, the National Health Federation and uh, to support David. Yes, and um, what, what of a state of affairs that now David and Lynn Thayer locked up in the same prison um, for what? Trying to help people with cancer. So yeah. they need your support and the more we can keep them in the public uh, view, the better. Well, let's move on a bit. Firstly, we've been speaking over the last few weeks about people writing letters and how powerful this can be. And we just like to put up this uh, particular email, which it, uh, a UK column viewer had passed back to a school after receiving their advice on uh, COVID. Um, now, I'm not privy to what exactly the school sent out, but we can tell from the response that this was a very good response. And I'd just like to quickly read it. The print's quite small, um, but um, the, the, uh, um, the text is asking a number of, of questions of the school and in particular masks. What is the scientific justification for the requirement? Has the recommendation come from uh, from any, some or all of the Scottish Government, NHS Scotland or the providers of the school or the providers of the school's risk assessment? What are the proposed essential exemptions from mask wearing? For example, asthma, allergies, anxiety, etc. Have the practicalities and the possible adverse consequences of, say, 15 children and a teacher together in a classroom all breathing their own expelled breath being considered. Uh, the following should be clarified in frequently answered questions. What alternative arrangements will be made for those pupils who might have skin allergies induced by frequent use of hand sanitizers? So these are very simple but very polite um, uh, specific questions which I think the school is going to have to work very hard to answer. Uh, there were a couple of supplementaries sent in. 
Uh, two further points, wearing of masks in the playground, one of the few issues where there appears to be agreement in the corona deb debate is that outdoor transmission of the virus is negligible. Uh, have the professors of public health considered the psychological aspects of the full list of recommendations? So we, we've been saying for some time that it does make a difference to get letters and emails into uh, authorities, public bodies, schools, hospitals, wherever, but stick to the subject and be specific with your questions and base those questions on factual evidence because this makes them very powerful. So we'll be interested to see what sort of response comes back from that. Uh, we're going to say well done and thank you for sharing them with us. Now, the guidance that's been given to us, we think is um, getting particularly um, uh, wobbly. So this is the, the telegraph from a couple of days ago and the headline was keep quiet on the two metre rule sage experts told the government denies that message passed down to scientists is official and insists there's no ban. But the telegraph did a really quite detailed article where they spelled out that internally um, the scientists were being told don't give your personal opinions on the two metre rule. And I think, Mike, there can only be one reason for that, that the government is now beginning to run scared over the fact that actually, if you get into certainly the two metre rule in the fresh air, there is no basis for it. So we're going to say unusually well done the Telegraph for starting to ask the right questions. But let's uh, pop over to The Guardian because The Guardian had an interesting article, uh, which is that the NHS was warning betting firms against using reckless ads to exploit football's return. And apparently those nasty betting companies desperate for business, uh, they want to see obviously the football games um, restored and they want to be making their money but the NHS has been taking them to task and this particular lady uh, Claire Murdoch um, the mental health director has really been going for the betting companies she said this the return of football will be a moment of excitement for millions but it must, must not be an excuse for gambling firms to open the floodgates of addiction plenty of people say enjoy a flutter but in the NHS we're increasingly seeing people in need of specialist help after they fall victim to excessive and aggressive marketing by betting companies and I'll just give you the second part the NHS is stepping up to the plate to offer specialist treatment but with my colleagues having spent this year focused on protecting people from a once in a generation global pandemic the last thing NHS staff and patients need is for avoidable harm to be caused by reckless advertising and behavior from the gambling industry as normal life begins to resume what we don't want to see over the next 48 hours is firms kicking off more aggressive advertising campaigns to make up for lost time so this lady really getting stuck in um, we'd like to ask a question a uk column question so the nhs mental health team is attacking the betting industry for its adverse mental health impact but the nhs is not warning of the dangers of the government deliberately ramping up fear anxiety and stress over covid19 there's silence from the nhs over that angle and i'd like to bring that into a bit more detail so here's the nhs page mental well-being while staying at home and uh, lots of words uh, just give you a flavor of the sorts of things that they flag up it says talk to us about your worries and um, there's a little paragraph there where basically uh, they say if you feel a bit worried or scared about the present situation it's okay to share your concerns so there we are it's normal to feel worried scared or helpless about the current situation uh, we've got this one here stay on top of those difficult feelings concerns about the coronavirus outbreak is perfectly normal however some people may experience intense anxiety that can affect their day-to-day -day lives so this is not a minor thing some people they're not going to be able to function properly as the result of the stress around COVID-19. And we'll bring this one in as well. Do not stay glued to the news. 
Um, what do they say? Try to limit the time you spend watching, reading or listening to coverage of the outbreak because they're acknowledging that the news can actually cause you psychological problems. So there's no doubt about it that the NHS mental health team clearly recognised the COVID-19 situation and its adverse impact on health. Now, let's just look at a little film clip that they produced in order to advise people how they could deal with some of these problems. Thoughts, feelings and behaviours continually affect each other and it's easy to develop negative patterns where unhelpful thoughts lead to unhelpful feelings and actions. Sometimes this can become a vicious cycle. Many of us don't realise that we can influence this process and that this can improve our mental health. The best way to deal with these unhelpful thoughts is to recognise them, challenge them and see if you can replace them. Some people call this the catch it, check it, change it approach. With practice, this can help us look at perceived problems from a different perspective. For example, you might be worried about an important task you have to do at work, convinced it will go wrong and everyone will think you're a failure. Rather than immediately accepting this thought and feeling even worse, take a moment to catch it and check it. Ask yourself whether there's good evidence for it or if there are other explanations. Try thinking about what you would say to a friend who was thinking this way. Finally, see if you can change the thought for a more positive one. Maybe, I'm prepared, I've put a lot of work in, and I'm going to do my best. Sometimes you will be able to change the thought to a positive one, but don't worry when at other times you can't. There are no right or wrong answers. It's about learning to think more flexibly and be more in control. By catching the thought, checking it, and seeing if you can change it, with practice, you can help break the negative cycle. So there we have it, a very simple little um, uh, film clip. And I think it put across some information very clearly. But I just want to say to viewers, just think about what was being said there, because it was talking about recognising unhelpful thoughts and challenging them recognize you have to be able to recognize the thought and then you can challenge it you can replace it and uh, it's talking about you seeing evidence so you've got to be able to recognize what's going on you've got to see the evidence for what's going on and then you can change what's happening to you so let's come back to the strategy from the uh, nhs over covid19 and the adverse impact on mental health because we're going to remind our viewers and listeners that of course we've had the behavioral insights team in partnership with the cabinet office deliberately ramping up fear anxiety and stress including turning communities against each other in order to pressurize people into for example wearing masks and at the same time we've got a government who's been boasting that they've been using applied behavioural psychology. This is all in the Mindspace document where citizens may not fully realise that their behaviour is being changed or at least how it's being changed. And the, clearly this opens the government up to charges and manipulation is not UK column comment. That's in the document itself. But the point we're making is that the government was boasting it was going to be able to affect the way people felt and behaved without them recognising that was being done. And if that is the case, then the NHS's advice is worthless because people who are experiencing fear don't necessarily know where this is coming from because of the techniques used by the British government. So what we've got is a brainwashing attack by the government. It's done covertly on the minds of people and it is affecting people's mental health. But surprisingly, the NHS mental health teams can't recognise it. And let's just bring in the behavioural insights team again. Remember, if you're dealing with them, as a social interest company, they are in fact working directly alongside the cabinet office. We've challenged them over their risk assessment. What risk assessment did they do before creating fear in the British public? And um, they said that the perceived level of personal threat needs to be increased and consideration be, should be given to the use of social disapproval. This is all stress, anxiety, fear 
in the public, which will give rise to mental health problems. Uh, well, of course, they didn't want to answer that at all. There was absolute silence. So we tried a phone call this morning, but uh, there doesn't appear to be anybody there. We left a message. But to date, the Behavioural Insights team does not want to say whether they carried out any form of risk assessment. Now, I've got a little bit more on this, which shows where this can go based in America. But Alex, this is very, very dangerous stuff. It's not the government just putting a policy through which people can see and understand overtly. This is the government using covert applied behavioral psychology, not to make our lives better, but to make us more fearful so that we're going to follow their policy. This to me smacks of uh, East Germany. And you probably haven't even had time to see in the comments, Brian, that uh, someone has put in the chat box that he's been warning for a while that the National Health Service's mental health service uh, strand is likely to morph into a 21st century Stasi. And that viewer is one of a, a veritable cluster who've come to us in recent weeks, let alone months, and have said they're very concerned about the mainstreaming of certain cult mental health ideas. The phrase mental health itself is a surprisingly late pedigree. It only really got going after the Second World War. It started to be bandied about in public policy circles between the wars. If you look a little bit further back to around the turn of the 20th century, it was in the multifarious cults of that era that mental health first got going. The offshoots of Christianity that devolved into you know, uh, groups of, of people concentrating on suppressing naughty thoughts and, and uh, calling sin a mental problem of attitude. That's where it came out. Now, what kind of entity is able to span all of those different milieus and, and thread them together? Really, it's a, a branch of the deep state seated in London, uh, which is wanting a worldwide empire, and which we know was uh, conducting experiments in several strands by the late 19th century on how to control different people through their perception of the world, and if necessary, tolerating certain kinds of, shall we say, heretical cults, as the late Roman Empire did, in, in return for the greater gain, which is that people uh, give their loyalty in their own different ways. Uh, to the, the central hub, shall we say. And you mentioned America in closing. I forget where it was, but somewhere in the northeastern US in recent days, I've saw, seen that advice has been given out to people to uh, ration their news diet and, and con uh, contain themselves to one or two approved mainstream sources per day for the sake of their mental health. So this is clearly not just in Britain. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Alex. Just let's follow through with this uh, bit of information, which a viewer kindly alerted me to. So it's wired uh, with this article, an army of volunteers is taking on vaccine disinformation online. Anti-vaccine messages on social media have tripled since the pandemic began. One public health group wants to teach pro-vaccine Americans to fight fire with fire. Now, I've just a few bullet points from the from the article. Uh, it says the numbers of people who will accept vaccinations in the USA is falling. Uh, they've been influenced by conspiracy theories and social media. And then it quotes a gentleman called Joe Smizer, the chief executive officer of Public Good Projects, a public health nonprofit that specializes in using social network analysis to implement large scale behavioral change programs. I don't get a warm feeling when I see that. His group has built online surveillance tools for tracking outbreaks of misinformation, disinformation and downright conspiracies. And uh, it's called Stronger and it aims to take the fight to anti-vaccine organisers where they've long had the upper hand on social media. So um, this to me is very aggressive, but this is using, as it says, large scale behavioural change. So if we go to the PGP group, here it is, the science and art for communication change. And we can bring in Joe Smizer himself. Now I've taken that from a uh, website called Provoke. You can have a look at the article on him. It's a CV, really. But here he is. Um, he says, I think true innovation comes from a place that is slow and quiet. And then as part of the interview, you see this. They ask him, what are you thinking about most these days? And he says, building tools that make uh, tools and techniques that make PR and marketing invisible to audiences. Uh, does PR and marketing equal propaganda? Well, 
uh, I'm going to say yes, in my opinion, because we know what he's doing. But what happens when you have a means of control um, that is invisible to the public? You can't see it. So if it's affecting you adversely, you can't fight it. You can't use any of the techniques that NHS mental health teams would have you use. You're completely vulnerable to it immensely dangerous and it shows desperation to use these techniques because the public is not being convinced about vaccines and quite rightly so um, okay well let's uh, quickly move on then because uh, obviously boris uh, was very excited during the uh, daily live stream yesterday about a new medication uh, for covid19 so let's just uh, briefly listen to what he had to say I'm absolutely delighted that the uh, biggest breakthrough yet has been made by a fantastic team of scientists uh, right here in the, the UK. I am proud of these British scientists backed by UK government funding who have led the first robust clinical trial anywhere in the world to find a coronavirus treatment proven to reduce the risk of death. Thank you. Uh, th this drug, dexamethasone, can now be made available across the NHS. And we've taken steps to ensure we have enough supplies, even in the event of a second peak. So dexamethasone, Brian, is what is being promoted as this magical cure for coronavirus. Now, of course, it's not a cure for coronavirus at all. Uh, it only helps people who are already uh, on uh, treatment uh, significant interventions for example on on a ventilator or already requiring oxygen uh, and they say that it uh, the government says it has uh, it, it reduces the risk of death by as much as 35 percent for people on ventilation uh, and as much as 20 percent uh, for patients on oxygen uh, and it reduces the total 28 day mortality rate by 17 percent they say uh, but the thing is that this is a drug which is being applied at the point where you're already seriously ill. Uh, and the drug that many doctors have been suggesting from the beginning that needs to be applied from before you get seriously ill, of course, is hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and uh, so yesterday, at the same time that Boris was announcing uh, that, the MHRA, the Medical Health Regulatory uh, medicines the health regulatory authority decided that it was going to uh, stop the hydroxychloroquine trials in the UK. We followed the emerging concerns about the use of hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19 and took into consideration the results from two different trials, in including the UK's recovery trial, which has provided convincing evidence of no meaningful mortality benefit in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Now, in hospitalized patients, this is the critical part because what they're looking at is applying hydroxychloroquine whenever somebody is already seriously ill. And in those circumstances, indeed, it doesn't seem to be beneficial. In fact, it can be detrimental. The people that are promoting hydroxychloroquine, the doctors are promoting it as a suitable treatment, are wanting it applied before the patient gets to that stage as a prophylactic effectively. But anyway, what they say there is two different trials. One of the trials that they're saying uh, give them concerns was the, uh, the recovery trial. Okay, uh, that's very interesting. But the other one they don't name. Well, I believe that the other one is this one. Uh, and this was the uh, uh, data that was published by The Lancet. And then The Lancet had to retract uh, the data or the retract the paper because effectively it turned out that the data was faked. And in fact, this data uh, was uh, informing another uh, report, another scientific paper in uh, the United States published by the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and uh, in fact, that also had to be retracted. Uh, and the authors apologized to the journal for, for having to, to take this action because they couldn't get access to the data. So the truth of this is, uh, according to uh, medical advice that we've had, is that of course, hydroxychloroquine has not been given a fair uh, trial here uh, and therefore uh, what this this new uh, drug which is being used is being described as as the British government attempting to cover their backs uh, and uh, it, it really doesn't help uh, it doesn't do enough 
uh, and we haven't looked at hydro or given hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine uh, the proper trials that it needs to have had. Now, why might that be? Well, of course, it's no longer in patent. It's extremely inexpensive. Uh, every, every dose of this new drug, dexamethasone, is, I believe, uh, about a fiver, uh, whereas hydroxychloroquine, a lot less expensive. So uh, we need to be looking at that. We certainly need to be not stopping trials yeah. for any medicine. And it's ridiculous that the MHRA has taken this step. Well, the same MHRA that's um, got David Noakes and Lynn Thayer locked up in a prison in France because they dared to uh, do their best to see if they can help people with cancer. Uh, absolutely. So MHRA, a lot of questions needed. Uh, no, that wasn't the only thing Boris said yesterday earlier. I think there should be a health warning, two videos Two with videos Boris. of Boris in, in one, in one. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, earlier in the day, he made a statement to Parliament. Uh, let's have a brief listen to that. So, sorry, wrong. Uh, do apologise. That's the video. Mr Speaker, with permission, I will make a statement about the ambitions of a global Britain. I have begun the biggest review of our foreign defence and development policy since the end of the Cold War, designed to maximise our influence and integrate all the strands of our international effort. The UK possesses the third biggest aid budget and diplomatic network in the world, and we owe it to our people to make best use of these assets, which scarcely any of our peers can match. The, the British taxpayer has a right to expect that we will achieve the maximum value for every pound that we spend. And one cardinal lesson of the pandemic is that distinctions between diplomacy and overseas development are artificial and outdated. So, so he went on, Alex, to, to uh, argue that, therefore, he needed to merge the Foreign and Commonwealth Office with the Department for International Development uh, on the basis that he's just, on the, or at least for the reasons he's just outlined. So I wanted to get your thoughts on this, because obviously there has been for a long time uh, competition between these two uh, departments. The Foreign Office, of course, is the senior department. Uh, Anne-Marie Trevelyan is the a Secretary of State that's going to lose her job. Dominic Raab will effectively take over the uh, the two departments. Uh, and uh, so where does this where does this leave us and how do you see this? I mean, he's talking at the very beginning of that uh, little thing about about global Britain and a complete review of uh, security and defense and so on. Where do you see this leaving uh, Britain's ability to project soft power? Is this is it, does this reinforce it, in fact, by bringing it all under one uh, fused uh, umbrella? Ultimately, things could lead that way. But in the short term, the losers are those who have grown under the patronage of the last three or four prime ministers. And it is noteworthy that the last three prime ministers have, in terms, criticised Mr Johnson's announcement in the last 24 hours and all have been brushed aside by Downing Street which to me indicates that in general terms, the last three prime ministers belong with the Mark Sedwill way of viewing the world. And that this prime minister, perhaps, perhaps partly due to his Dominic Cummings influence, does not fully view the world in those terms. If we trace things back, uh, if you want to understand something, you reverse engineer it. Why are they being brought together or rehoused in the same building or same agency or ministry? Well, why was the Department for International Development created in the first place? The name is only it only dates from the late 90s. Uh, the idea of a minister, a junior minister in Her Majesty's Government for International Development comes from the dying embers of the Margaret Thatcher premiership uh, when Baroness Linda Chalker, uh, as a junior foreign office minister, was the first Secretary of State for International Development. And if you remember those days, it was all about the, the fate of the sub-state ethnic groups whom we couldn't get at through diplomacy because they were the Saddam Husseins of the world in the way. So we would help the, the cause celebra like the Kurds or equivalents in South America through aid because we could not do diplomacy with them. So if, and this is my hypothesis is an if, if it is the case that Cummings and others are, have the ear of Mr. Uh, Johnson and are persuading him once again to do business with nations, not least because we now need to do trade deals and form uh, alliances of sovereign nations as voting blocks in the UN and the like, then it is that we are perhaps bidding farewell, cutting loose 
or perhaps putting sweeping under the carpet somewhere our policy of spending oodles of cash trying to turn the hearts and minds of population groups within countries and instead trying to do sweetheart deals in the good old 1970s way of you know buy this from us and uh, we'll pay you a backhander that's the cynical uh, approach to what's happening but certainly the as i saw when i was um going to uh, preparatory meetings for the Joint Intelligence Committee that happened all the time. I remember once I actually had to, to make a, a, a desktop sign for the attendee from the Department for International Development because they hadn't thought to put one in. And I remember at the time thinking, um, OK, so we're entering a new stage. This would have been 2002, in which the Department for International Development under the Blair, the height of the Blair Ministries, um, has different policy aims to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Well, if you take that to its ultimate, what that means is for the last two decades, there was a department in Whitehall that had a foreign policy that was not British foreign policy, at least not the British people's foreign policy. Quite an uncomfortable thought. It may be that that is becoming a bit too painfully obvious to people now and has to be covered up again. OK, thank you very much for that. More work to be done in that area. Well, um, just for a bit of amusement, we've covered it. Guardian article or a couple of Guardian articles. Uh, when I read the Guardian article online, I got to this little message from the Guardian, uh, which I had to share with you. Uh, it's so incredible. It says, with those in power failing us at this historic moment, we demand better. From the coronavirus pandemic and police brutality to the marginalization of minority communities around the world, leadership is broken, devoid of the humility and inclusivity that we so desperately need. And given to narcissism, leaders are gambling with public health. They'll be betting on football next, Mike. Uh, safety in the future of younger generations. Uh, they unapologetically prioritise serving themselves over the people they were elected to serve. We have to make them raise their game. Well, this was stirring stuff, and I'm afraid there was more. That's what The Guardian's here for. Really? As an open, independent news organisation, we investigate, interrogate and expose the incompetence and indifference of those in power without fear. Who wrote this dross? Our journalism is free from political and commercial bias. No, it's not. This makes us different. We can give a voice to the oppressed and neglected and stand in solidarity with those that are calling for a fairer future. With your help, we can bring about improvement. Well, what help do they want? Well, it doesn't take a lot to uh, get in. They've got a underwear in a twist because the uh, public sector funding gravy train, which they used to rely on, adverts from the nasty government has dried up and so what are they after well they say that millions are flocking to the guardian for quality news every day i don't think so Maybe uh, going for a laugh uh, we believe everyone deserves access to information that is fact checked and analysis that has authority and integrity initiative yes we, <laughs> we're determined to provide journalism that helps each of us better understand the world and takes action that challenge, unite and inspires change in times of crisis and beyond. It was somebody drinking when they wrote this? I don't know. But news organisations are facing an existential threat with advertising revenues plummeting. The Guardian risks losing a major source of its funding. More than ever before, we're reliant on financial support from readers to fill the gap. So there you are, the Guardian begging for pennies. It says that millions of people are flocking to it, but apparently those millions are so unimpressed with the Guardian, they don't want to give it any money. Yeah. Anyway, am I being unkind, Alex? I'm sure in your past you read the old Guardian article. Oh, in their time, they have done endless exposés and they used to be uh, champions of the British working man and woman. Absolutely, they did. But they are massively dependent now on public sector uh, subscriptions, often bulk subscriptions. Uh, notoriously, the BBC has a huge bulk subscription for its staff and also on public sector ad uh, vacancy advertising revenue. Uh, so it is very much Whitehall talking unto Whitehall. I was very struck by that mission statement there. It reads a bit like the uh, ecumenical creed of the World Council of Churches, particularly when we get on to, yes, we want to do journalism and we want to take action to unite the world. Um, the Church of the Woke, anyone? Uh, sadly for them, of course, uh, they're now facing some pressure to abolish themselves because they were founded by a man who had interests in slavery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. 
And I don't know whether it's true or not, but somebody did send us a little email saying The Guardian's quite interesting because they started out as the Manchester Guardian yeah, in 1821, yeah. I think. And if you look at the person who helped start them, he was possibly involved with a little bit of slave trading. Well, that's, Sorry? That's what Alex just said. Oh, you just said that, Alex, did you? I missed that key part. I was so overwhelmed with The Guardian words. <laughs> I think clearly, Brian, what we need to do is to revise the UK column mission statement so that we're all singing from the same page. Otherwise, I think <laughs> curtains for you or me. No, at least it shows that we don't prepare these things uh, beforehand. They come together on the day. So my mistake. I'm sorry about that. Well, that's that's it for the news today. Um, what would we like people to do? Check all of our information check what we're talking about help mike with the research on the gentleman about black lives matter and get writing and pushing out those letters if you've never done it before just take a bit of time choose one or two accurate points put your evidence down address it get it in the post box and you will feel better if we had enough people doing this we'd soon uh, Get, I think Boris's hair standing up a little bit more from those uh, pictures. We'll leave it there. We'll be back at the same time on Friday. Bye-bye.